So today we're going to wrap up the 1950s, and we're going to do that kind of by taking a look at popular culture. And, and throughout the, the semester, we've talked about aspects of popular culture primarily as a way to view uh, the mindset and the the status of uh, of the the health of the people. Um, the more creative, the more expansive, the more inclusive that, that popular culture becomes, uh, the closer to a world you might recognize, the more closed, the um, uh, more conservative form of, of, of culture. Again, we see that exists today. We have, we've, we've had these two halves of our culture for uh, our entire lives as, as, as a country. Uh, we're one of the very few countries that has a a two-party system. We're one of the few countries that just has these binaries of, of right, wrong, left, right, up, down. Uh, and much of this is, is really clearly illustrated in, in the 1950s. And one way that the 1950s really steps up, so to speak, is in the area of youth culture. Now, we had talked a little bit about during the 1920s how there was some separation between the, the uh, generations, between primarily the parents and the, and the younger, the youth uh, generation. Um, but there was still a lot of, uh, the, even though there was some separation, um, there was still a lot of, of overlap. Very few products were marketed to one group or the other. Most of them were marketed to, to uh, all groups. In the 1950s, we come out and we've got this, this massive prosperity coming out of, of the World War. We have middle-class families with disposable income. We have teenagers, for the first time in their lives, do not have to go to work. Right? Prior to the 1920s, uh, you know, children uh, were, were working in factories you know, before the turn of the century. By the time we get to the 1920s, uh, most people, once you're 16 years of age or older, you're out of school and you're working. Um, and so here we get to the 1950s, and you reach the age where normally you would have been, you know, in, in just prior generations, you'd be going out and starting a family and starting your career or, or getting a job that would hopefully would sustain you. Uh, and now you've got free time, and you get to go to high school, and you get to go to college, and you get to play, and you get to have, uh, and, and, and because of this disposable income that, these, that the youth have, companies begin to market music and clothes and movies and all kinds of things specifically to that demographic for really the first time. You know, we, 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 sometimes you, we, we lament the, the advertising that's geared to children. That didn't even exist until the 1970s and 1980s where, where we really started gearing cereal products and, uh, and excessive toys and all kinds of stuff directly to the children uh, rather than advertising with adults and say, gee, wouldn't your child like this toy? And so um, it is this, this bifurcation of, the, uh, of society into these different cultures, often based by, by age. So not only are we now dis d divided by race and ethnicity, we also are divided by uh, youth, sexuality, etc., etc., etc. And that youth culture manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways we see this is movies that are made about this teenage rebellion. This, uh, uh, James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause, Marlon Brando, The Wild One, these are stories of dis disenchanted, white, middle-class, privileged youth who uh, just can't deal. They just can't deal with the, with the real world. It's so rough on them. But there are a lot of white males, right, many of them who are now in the Tea Party, uh, many, many white males who relate to this, this, this angst. Of course, you know, there are a whole bunch of reasons for this, but uh, a lot of this has to do with, with, we're told how wonderful the world is, and yet it really isn't that wonderful. The, the, the father knows best, the, the uh, leave it to beaver world doesn't really exist out here in, in the woods. Everything changes in 56 with the arrival of Elvis the pelvis, right? Um, you know, you think of twerking. This guy just swiveled his hips and they wouldn't put him on TV from the waist. You know, it wouldn't allow anything from the waist down to be shown because it was considered obscene. Can you imagine today's dances being put on the TV? It, 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 people would, would have had heart attacks. Um, and, and Elvis, of course, is, is kind of at the apex of uh, what's going on at this point. 
uh, Sam Phillips, the guy who, who ran Sun Records, uh, who discovers Elvis along with several other white performers, Roy Orbison and Jerry Lee Lewis and, and uh, uh, Carl Perkins. Uh, these the, the Elvis was uh, Sam's uh, dream. He said, if I can find a white man who can sound and sing like a black man, I can make a million dollars. And he did. Um, but this was nothing new either. In the 1930s, we had people like Perry Como and, and um, um, Bing Crosby and even Frank Sinatra who mimicked black crooners. Uh, in the, in, you know, jazz in the 1920s was based on a combination of, of klezmer from Eastern Europe mixed with um, uh, rhythm of blues and blues and, and, and music from the American South and, and traditional African rhythms. And you throw all that together and you end up with uh, um, jazz in the 20s, you end up with rock and roll in the 50s. And so the, the, these divisions between the young and the old, this, this is invented in the 1950s primarily as a marketing scheme. On the 3rd of June 1956, authorities in the Californian city of Santa Cruz banned rock and roll music at public gatherings. The previous evening had seen around 200 teenagers attend a concert at the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium by the Los Angeles-based Chuck Higgins and his orchestra. Higgins and his earlier band, the Melotones, had scored a West Coast hit four years earlier with the saxophone instrumental Pachuco Hop. This jump blues single has since been described as one of the key releases that bridged the upbeat jazz styles of the 1940s to the frenetic rhythm and blues that was to emerge the following decade. Shortly after midnight, members of the Santa Cruz police, under the command of Lieutenant Richard Overton, entered the Civic Auditorium venue and shut down the concert. Lieutenant Overton later described the predominantly teenage crowd inside the auditorium as being engaged in suggestive, stimulating and tantalising motions induced by the provocative rhythms of an all-Negro band. The next day, the Santa Cruz authorities announced an outright ban on rock and roll music in the city, with the justification that rock and roll and other forms of frenzied music were detrimental to both the health and morals of our youth and community. According to a report in a local newspaper from the time, the chief of police later said that we have nothing against rock and roll music, it's just what some people do while listening to it. Within days, however, Santa Cruz's teenagers had begun to protest against the ban. In response, city manager Robert Klein announced that the music, along with other harmless types of swing music enjoyable to young and old, was actually welcome in Santa Cruz. Despite this, a scheduled concert by another rock and roll artist was cancelled by the auditorium manager. So while that, remember that first image I showed you at the very beginning of the uh, two kids sitting at the soda fountain sharing a, a, a paper cup soda with a couple of straws. That's, that's how most people viewed uh, the youth of the 50s. Uh, the youth of the 50s had a completely different view of themselves and this is much more uh, uh, akin to what how youth saw themselves and, and students do this today right you, know, you, you want to wear that hottest miniskirt to, to to junior high well you you buy a skirt that's a little bit longer and then after you've left the house you roll it up so it gets shorter right um and that's 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 common and that happens with every generation you guys did not invent anything we did it before one of the things you, you might, might get a kick out of is notice that this is a cigarette machine that she's using to uh, quaff here uh it's a cigarette machine. This is the YMCA in New York, or one of the YMCA's in New York. This is the pool area. This is, is actually a, um, uh, a health-oriented place where they sold cigarettes right on the premises. Summer, 1953. The Korean War is ending. Francis Crick and James Watson decode the structure of DNA. But the biggest news event in America is the publication of a book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, otherwise known 
as the Kinsey Report. In boardrooms, in barber shops, at the ballpark, people standing on the corner, they talk about Alfred Kinsey's data. I think it's a good thing. I think the more you know about anything, the better you can do it, and the better you can do it, the more successful you are. Suddenly someone had said, here's the American sex report card, and this is what it looks like. And I think that's what caused the huge reaction. At the center of the storm was an unlikely figure, a 59-year-old professor of zoology from Indiana University named Alfred Kinsey. Kinsey had done what no one had dared do before, interview thousands of Americans about their sexual experiences. This research has been possible because over the past 15 years, some tens of thousands of people have cooperated. Kinsey wanted to interview every kind of sexual activity and to hear every different kind of story and every different kind of account of sexuality. He made you feel that you were not talking about yourself even though you were. Somehow, uh, in the first five minutes, you would be telling him things you had never told anybody. What Alfred Kinsey would tell Americans about sex would shake them to their core. Suddenly, the conspiracy of silence is shattered in a society that had been tapped down. And really, things will never be the same again. So in addition to the rise of youth culture and the, uh, an entirely new uh, point of view at looking at human sexuality in, in, in the American experiment, we begin to see other experiments. All of the boundaries of culture are being pushed back at this particular time in, in, in our, our history. And we see people like Jack Kerouac, a, a young author who writes a 250-page book with, with no punctuation, no, no periods, no commas, no capitalization, run-on sentences, everything that would be wrong in English class. And, and it's just really a mind dump of uh, drug and alcohol-induced dreams and nightmares, uh, sexual encounters with uh, um, other men, with groups, with, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just this amazing road trip across the, the, the country in a way that America had never viewed itself. And so people like Kerouac and, and others become part of this, this questioning, what is America? Is it just white middle class males or is there something else is there something that isn't part of the hegemonic part of the 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 the, the cis world and we begin to see primarily in the east bay in the, the bay area in san francisco in the bay area and in in greenwich village in new york we begin to see the rise of of a phenomenon known as coffee shops now it's not a Starbucks. These are, are locally owned and, and sourced. They tend to be usually run by artists of some sort, musicians, poets, authors, uh, performers, um, painters, sculptors. Um, and there is an atmosphere in these, these coffee shops of, of openness. Uh, I love this photograph. This is taken up in, in uh, the East Bay. And you see, number one, it's got a mixed clientele and not just mixed at separate tables mixed across the board um, you see that that the uh, I love this wall because all of the things are going on bands and you know concerts and performances and uh, tours and speeches and talks and uh, yoga groups and this and that and the other thing all this stuff is kind of filtering a around the edges of the counterculture being based in these coffee shops and these coffee shops that are are being occupied by the original hipsters that's what we call them they were hipsters the hippies come out of the hipsters and then the new hipsters come in but there's no relation to the original hipsters the, these are the hipsters, the hepcats, these are the beatniks. These are the, the uh, uh, this is the, the initial counterculture that will lead then to the 60s counterculture and the hippies will come out of where these guys start. And one of the guys that's part of this movement is a guy named Allen Ginsberg. And Allen Ginsberg was a uh, uh, literature professor. Uh, he was gay, he was Jewish, he was closeted. He was trying to survive in a white male cis world and it built up and he produced this poem really that throws him out onto the, to the national scene, uh, a poem called Howl. And uh, this is uh, essentially the original rage against the machine. The 1950s is also a period when uh, several things collide. 
And no pun intended. Sorry about that, guys. We have the Cold War. We have youth culture. We have a uh, an interest in space. We have a heavy, heavy commitment to science, unlike today. And these come together into an interesting combination of, of cultural uh, output that has many, 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 many layers. We can look at a lot of the films of the 50s and say, these are just schlock pieces of shit. And in many respects, they are. But there was this whole stream of science fiction, primarily movies that were made during the 50s, that were made by people who might not have had the same political leanings as, as the bulk of the country at the time. Um, there's this combination of fear of the other, right? That's attached to the Cold War. Fear of invasion, fear of war. Um, there's this entire uh, belief that, you know, we are completely incompatible with the other side of the earth. That if the, the uh, communists and the uh, uh, capitalists get together, it's just going to be this huge uh, explosion. The worlds will combine. Com combine and, and people will die. And we see this reflected um, almost subliminally because they, they couldn't do it overtly. And so often in movies that were made for the driving, that were made for teenagers, not for mainstream, these anti-war messages, these uh, uh, anti-communist messages, these pro-science messages, a lot of these things, some of which are progressive, some of which are quite conservative, but in many cases, the only place where these messages could come through was uh, through these science fiction films. And so, for example, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers has an awful lot about flying saucers, but it's really a, uh, a if you look, like flying saucers invade our planet, Washington, London, Paris, Moscow, right? All right, they invaded Moscow, but really the story is about what happens when the communists invade us. That's really the, uh, the situation that we're talking about here. Uh, when worlds collide, of course, there's a big red planet crashes into the Earth, right? And causes, causes all kinds of mayhem. That probably is uh, self-explanatory. The Day the Earth Stood Still is a massive anti-war film. Um, it, it's, again, couched in these messages of, of, uh, of science and, and monsters and all this stuff. There's no big gorilla hand in there. Uh, but the rest of it is, is uh, pretty cool. Uh, great movie. Uh, of the three that are up there right now, The Day of the Earth Stood Still, which is directed by uh, Robert Wise, uh, is a classic. The other two are, are classics of the schlock genre. They're not bad movies. They, were, they spent a little bit of money on both of them. Uh, uh, the Day of the Earth Stood Still was a major, major production. Likewise, the fear of, and this has to do a lot with the McCarthy era, the, the McCarthy era, the anti-commie situation that's going on with congressional hearings all over the country and all that, and this fear of your neighbor. Your neighbor might be the other. You can't trust your neighbor. You don't know who's a commie and who isn't. And so f you see uh, a couple of movies, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which has been remade a couple of times, uh, which is the big budget one. I Married a Monster from Outer Space, which is the low budget one. But essentially, both of these movies tell the story of suddenly people you know, friends, family members, neighbors, they're not maybe you don't know them maybe they're maybe they're not really those people maybe maybe they're maybe they've been taken over by some foreign power right in other words uh, and and what and what both of these movies are about is human beings are taken and then doppelgangers or lookalikes are created by these aliens to take their place. They move into uh, uh, the, the human population for the ability to take it over. In both cases, they want the planet, want to get rid of humans. And so in order to do that, they usurp the form of humans temporarily while they are either mating with, in the case of the I Married a Monster, or uh, replacing, in the case of the Body Snatchers, uh, human beings. Again, a big anti-commie, anti-red uh, 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 message is, is deeply buried within these two movies. One, big budget. One, eh, not so much. Radiation, of course, after Hiroshima became a huge issue, and there were hundreds of, of, of movies made uh, about the effects or the perceived effects of uh, the nuclear bomb. 
um, people continued to grow tumors uh, at, at massive rates for 15 years after uh, these bombs were dropped. So by the time we get to the mid-50s, we see a lot of, of especially low-budget ones, where we're dealing with, uh, instead of tumors, which is just a, a growth of, a rapid growth of cells, cells are growing out of control. Uh, but if they can do that, then maybe the entire animal could grow to hum humongous size, right? Enormous size. Uh, and there's all kinds of stuff. There's tech the killer... Uh, killer shrews, there's the killer leeches, there's the attack of the crab monsters, there's them, which is the best 3D filmed but never shown, the best 3D uh, giant ants in the subways of Los Angeles movie ever made. They'll never make another one as good as, as, as this one. And that then, of course, gets extended into the idea of uh, hu giant humans. And we get attack of the 54 woman. That image, by the way, never shows up. Uh, that's not the outfit that the 50 foot woman uh, wears. She's never standing, crouching over a freeway. She never picks up cars. She's, you know, it, 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 this is all about the poster. Amazing Colossal Man. There actually are two sequels to the blasted thing. Um, and the these are made by a, a producer called Bert I. Gordon. And it always cracked me up that, that he always put his middle initial in and and he's this this is one of the poverty row producers cheap actors cheap production these were cranked out for the drive-in and then later for for saturday matinees and 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 for uh early tv and they were they're schlock movies but every single one of the ones that bert i gordon produces have giants in them and it wasn't until I was in my late 50s, early 60s, that I looked at it and I realized that Bird Eye Gordon's initials are B-I-G. Godzilla, king of the monsters, alive, surging up from the depths of the sea on a tidal wave of terror to wreak vengeance on mankind. Godzilla, king of the monsters, it's alive. A gigantic beast. Stalking the earth, crushing all before it in a cyclonic cavalcade of electrifying horror, raging through the streets on a rampage of total destruction. Godzilla, king of the monsters, incredible titan of terror, wiping out a city of six million in a holocaust of flame. Jet flames cannot destroy it, bombs cannot kill it, all modern weapons fail. Is this the end of our civilization? Can the scientists of the world find a way to stop this creature? For the answer, see Godzilla, King of the Monsters. You may wish to deny it, but your eyes tell you it's true. A tale to stun the mind. More fantastic than any ever written by Jules Verne. More terrifying than any ever shown on the screen. Awesome. Incredible. Unbelievable! A story beyond your wildest dreams. Dynamic violence. Savage action. Spectacular thrills. Godzilla, king of the monsters. Fantastic beyond comprehension. Gripping beyond compare. Astounding beyond belief. The mightiest monster of them all. See Godzilla, king of the monsters. This is the original poster for the original Godzilla. Now, the, the, the trailer that you just saw was for the American release, which was several years later. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I know they, they keep coming out with new Godzilla movies all of the time, but if you ever get a chance, please go back and watch the original Godzilla. Not Godzilla, King of the Monsters. That's the one that's been dubbed into English and very, very, very well crafted uh, to take to, to actually film new scenes with American actors and then sandwiching them in to make a movie that was a little bit more palatable for American audiences. And the reason that I say that is that if you watch the original, the original Godzilla, not Godzilla King of the Monsters, which is the American reissue of this movie, but the original, you have to watch it with subtitles, but if you're used to watching Japanese stuff, and you're probably used to watching subs, um, the let's think about what Godzilla is for just a minute. Godzilla is a monster who kills Japanese people, destroys Japanese cities with fire 
and radiation, causing massive destruction. In other words, Godzilla is the United States. Godzilla destroys Tokyo with firebombing for days, for a week before the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No one else has ever killed people with radiation. No one else has after, ever destroyed entire cities. If you go to Japan today, the majority of the cities, um, nothing was, I exists. It's older than the 1950s. A few temples here and there, a few other places here and there, but, but there are very, very few um, older buildings because we destroyed it. And so coming out in the, in the mid-50s, uh, this first Japanese monster movie, The Granddaddy of Maul, kind of an answer to King Kong. But really, this is a, a social commentary on the relationship between the United States and Japan. Now, not all of the movies that were made during the, the, the 50s uh, made a whole hell of a lot of sense. This is... <laughs> Armadillo Woman from Outer Space. Now, I have been looking for this movie for years. I saw this poster many years ago when I was first teaching and putting together this lecture. And I thought, God, I've got to find this movie because it's a Spanish-Japanese-English language, uh, uh, American production. So it's Toho. It's, got, it, it's, it's produced by Honda, the same guy who does Godzilla. I mean, th this should be a movie you should be able to find. I have looked everywhere for it. I have never been able to find a, a copy of this bootleg or otherwise. If you ever come across Armadillo Woman from Outer Space, find my email, send me a link. I want to watch this movie. I don't have a bucket list, but the, one of the things I do want to do before I die is I do want to see what is possibly one of the worst movies ever made, and that, of course, is armadillo woman uh, from outer space and that pretty much wraps up the 50s at this point and uh, when we come back for our next lecture we will begin uh, the 1960s